This is the story of a wedding in Monaco, of the American girl about to become Princess of Monaco, and of Chateau Postien, Duchess of Valentinois, of Mazarin, of Mayenne, Baroness of Saint Lô, of La Lutumière, of Amby, of Alkirch, Countess of Ferret, of Belfort, of Tan, of Rosemont, Marquise of Guicard, of Beau, Lady of Saint Remy, Lady of many another domain. In the space of one hour, Miss Grace Kelly, all of these historic and beautiful titles will be yours. You will have become the bride of His Serene Highness, the Prince of Monaco, and history will once again have been made by love. Here is the backdrop for this wondrous and unique adventure, for every marriage is a true adventure. Here is the Principality of Monaco. A complete tour of Monaco's frontiers quickly shows that we're dealing with probably the tiniest sovereign state in the entire world of men. But it is said of this diminutive land that through seven centuries the spirit of happiness has been in residence here without ever feeling itself out of place. The family dwellings seem to have arranged themselves with an artistic perfection in the exquisite landscape that has been given to them. The inhabitants of those dwellings are the 4,000 subjects of the Prince of Monaco and 16,000 friends from other lands who have been happy to accept residence here. And so, in only a few brief seconds, we have examined the Principality from every side. Let us now look at the palace, the traditional residence throughout the centuries of His Serene Highness, the Sovereign Prince. From the height of these ramparts, which bear no menace to anyone, the princes of Monaco have almost literally watched over the peace and well-being of their people, for little in all the land could well escape their eyes. And finally, here is the port, the charming, the perfect little port of Monaco. And there is the sea. And our picture of the Principality is complete. One morning, not long ago, two young faces appeared in Monaco's windows. And then the Monegasques seemed to be seized by a sort of joyous frenzy. For this was the signal they had been waiting for. The signal for them to make ready the wedding of their prince. In the art of arranging joyous and brilliant festivals, the people of this little country are veritable jewelers by tradition. But this time, from all signs, the occasion has become something more, an affair of honor. From machinist to musician, from decorator to star entertainer, each is moved by the same inspiration. This wedding must be the most successful, the most beautiful, the most amazing of events, the closest thing to perfection. Everything has been thought of. Not a button will be missing from the legging of a guard. The sentry box takes on a rejuvenated air. The carabinieri have tried on their parade uniforms. The flowers for the garden party are here. In the prince's garage, the cars are ready and waiting. The wine cellar is prepared to yield up its treasures. And so is the kitchen, where secret recipes are brought out. The upholsterer completes his task just in time. Everything has been put in perfect order. The paneling, the chandeliers, the lamps, all will do perfect honor to the high tradition of the house. And here is the first bouquet of a newborn carnation to be called the Princess Grace. The chief of protocol scrupulously corrects his final invitation list. The prince's valet gives a last brush stroke to the uniform to be worn on the great day. The 
table for the first meal is perfectly arranged, well in advance of the hour. All the preparations are now complete, and many good people are breathing more easily. As you can see, the great day seems to have ordered for itself a perfect sunlight. The port of Monaco seems to have adorned itself in its loveliest colors. And the princely flag has found a precise wind to give it that curve of elegance. And here, probably somewhat astonished to find itself entering Monegascan waters, is the Constitution. Hereafter, in speaking of this ship, people will say, you know, the American liner that brought the bride of the century to her prince. And by that, almost anyone will know what vessel is meant. Of course, little thought is given to the fact that there are on this ship two or three thousand people who have just traveled from one continent to another. All thoughts are on how America, in the person of the most beautiful of her daughters, will encounter Monaco in the person of her prince. The prince's yacht, all white, has just taken to sea. This means that in five minutes, we will witness the encounter for which we have been waiting. Like all the witnesses of this meeting, like almost everybody the whole world over, we are waiting to see Grace Kelly through the eyes of Rainier of Monaco. Most of us, of course, will see all of this by means of other eyes. For the vessels that form an escort around the yacht of the Prince owe the representatives of television, radio, film, of all the newspapers of the world. Only one more moment to wait. These must be the words that Renier is speaking to himself. Which of us will be the first to catch a glimpse of the hat, that immense hat? Which of us will succeed in following the tall, slim silhouette through the complicated movement from ship to ship? Who will have seen the prince first clasping the extended hand? It doesn't matter, for here now is the precise image that will long remain in the memories of many of us. The Constitution prepares to resume what must now seem to be her monotonous destiny. On the bridge of the white yacht, the prince and princess-to-be are ready to receive the greeting of Monaco. And a whole new chapter begins. At the entrance of the port of Monaco, a surprise awaits Miss Kelly. For all the seas and all the oceans of the world have dispatched their most distinguished yachts to attend the princely marriage. Each canopy, each deck pennant, today seems to herald forth its message of goodwill. It is in this way that history sometimes likes to take on the character of legend. To greet the brides of princes, 
there must always be nice little girls reciting compliments. And here are ours. The ceremonial greeting unrolls, immutable and perfect, with a tiny note of diffidence on one side or the other, like an exchange of confidences offered by the fiancé to the people and by the people to the fiancé. This night, under the family lamps in Monegascan homes, there will be much talk of your beauty, Miss Kelly, of your youthfulness and that of the prince, and of the inscrutable fate that unites you. At the summit of the famous rock, the ancient and noble residence that will be your home awaits you. From this evening onward, you will be sheltered within the golden paneling of her walls. There you may well find repose. On the battlements, as in the legends that come alive in each chapter of this chronicle of a marriage of today, we find the gods on watch. Night has covered the Principality with a blue mantle that suits her best. And legend and history persistently continue to mingle. For under the windows, my lady, as in times gone by, the musicians have come to bring their serenade. The colors, the voices, the night itself sings of love. Your love, madame, and yours, monseigneur. the last sparks will have gone out against the ceiling of heaven, these portraits of the ancient masters of the palace might look down upon a strange enough apparition. Miss Kelly might wish, all alone, to stand before the lessons of the past. Charles III, Miss Kelly, his memory is celebrated as that of a rare benefactor. His mother, Princess Caroline, who helped him to make the principality the country of perfect happiness the country that tomorrow will be yours. Honoré III of Monaco, a most illustrious personage, as was Prince Louis II, the...